So right after this conversation that you guys are about to listen to, I had to come outside and uh, film a quick intro because I was so excited. Five years ago, Evan Rowley booked a flight to Thailand, a one-way flight with no accommodations, no money, and no plans. Five years later, he's still there and he's built a motorcycle tour company there in Thailand. This is a wild story that you cannot miss. So Evan Rowley, who is he? He's an American founder of the Ride of Passage, which is a Thai travel company that combines personal growth and camaraderie and adventure, those three elements. He himself, though, is building a life of freedom uh, and sovereignty through Bitcoin and travel, two elements that I try to espouse on this channel as well. Uh, I had to write down all of the things that I learned throughout this conversation that you are also going to learn. It's quite the doozy. But our topics of conversation range from what really happened to Western men and the position that we're in today, uh, his adventure down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and what he's learned in that process, how and why he chose Thailand five years ago, uh, what you can expect from the Thai culture and Buddhism, which is a really, really fascinating conversation, how he thinks that has eradicated his social anxiety, why he started a motorcycle tour company and what his goal and mission is with that tour company. And finally, probably most importantly, stay for the end for this, a major discounted opportunity for you, the Freedom Biles list. Enjoy this very wide ranging conversation. Without further ado, this is Evan Rowley. Captain Sid, it's great to have you on the Freedom Files podcast. I think a natural place to start is what sovereignty means to you as, as a Bitcoiner, as an international man, what does sovereignty mean to you? So sovereignty to me really begins with responsibility, with taking responsibility for the direction of your own life and the reality around you. And I've slowly developed that love of sovereignty, the desire for sovereignty, the older I've gotten, because the more I've realized that the world does not look out for you. You have to put in the work, you have to build what you need to support yourself, strengthen relationships, to make sure that you're happy and healthy and successful and that the people around you are happy and healthy and successful. And none of that is taken for granted, it can very easily go south. And growing up, it, it seems like in America, there's this abdication of responsibility going on that there's a, it's also a demonization of strength that people, uh, look down on the the strong and the responsible and it's leading to decay to neglect of all the hard work that makes life better for everyone else so it's no wonder that there's this dread that tomorrow will be worse than today and it took me a lot of reflection we'll get into moving to thailand and everything but a lot of reflection after leaving the us that that's what's really going on people have let go of responsibility. They're demonizing people who take responsibility. And now there's a dread that everything is getting worse and worse and worse. Well, no wonder it's getting worse. So to me, sovereignty is the, the act of standing up and taking responsibility for the direction of your own life. For me, that was leaving the U S and building a whole new life abroad, but that's taken so many different avenues, which we'll get into. Why do you think that happened? Why, why do you think there was such a strong abdication of masculinity and responsibility? And it's not just happening in the US, it's happening in Canada, it's happening in Western Europe, and you can see it plain as day, especially when you go to Western Europe, but you, mm -hmm. you see it in daily life in the United States, you see it in daily life in Canada, and it, that, the, that, the ab that abdication of masculinity, that abdication of responsibility, I don't think exists as much outside of the West as most people think it does. Why do you think that has happened in the U S in Western Europe and Canada, probably Australia as well, and not so much in other regions of the world? I think for, for lack of a better way to describe it, it's the West got fat and complacent and quite literally fat in America's case, but everything has been so good for so long that we haven't needed the values of traditional masculinity of 
of strength because you don't need to be strong when you go to a nine to five job every day and clock in and clock out and go home and have a couple beers and go to sleep. Everything is, is fine. But if nobody is defending that and ensuring that that peace and prosperity continues, then it will decay from the inside out. And I think that's what we're seeing is now that there's a crisis, now that there are challenges to a Western way of life, that there are challenges to peace and prosperity, people don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to, to defend it anymore because they don't have that strength mentally or physically to, to deal with adversity. So they just implode basically. And I think that's what we're seeing yeah. across the West. One of my, well, actually two of my favorite books. Um, well, one is one of my favorites. Another is just kind of a, a platitude book that, that has gained a lot of mention and popularity in the, in the recent years are, uh, the fourth turning, which is a, a really famous book among Bitcoiners hasn't really hit the mainstream as much as Bitcoiners would probably like and the changing world order by Ray Dalio. In mm -hmm. both of those books, the authors detail the changing, well, the changing world order, where every country, but they're specifically talking about the United States, goes through these ebbs and flows, these natural ebbs and flows in their nation's history. From the day that the United States was founded in 1776, we've gone through these generational flows every about 20 years we've gone through a different turning um, as the, as the authors of the fourth turning detail. And we're entering this, well, we entered this fourth turning around 2008, right? I think mm -hmm. around 2005, they predicted this was written in the 1990s. They predicted that something big would happen in the late two thousands. And what do you know, the great recession hit and changed everyone's minds about the direction of the United States. We're still coming out of that, that wave. And we don't know what that's going to be like going into the first turning, what, what that's going to be like now that China has gained a lot of, uh, power and influence in the world with their belt and road initiative and their powerful army, um, as well as a, a growing and strong economy. So I think you're right. Um, in the changing world order, Ray Dalio is kind of notoriously a, a fan of China. And he, he thinks that China will rise and overtake the United States, no matter how, how foolish that might sound, especially when you look at the data of how strong the U S world reserve currency is, but where's that heading? Um, mm -hmm. before we get into Bitcoin, which, which I know you have quite a bit to, to say about, uh, Evan is a question about your personal story. What is there something that happened to you that let's say five years ago made you realize that you weren't sovereign enough or that you weren't responsible enough or you weren't masculine enough? Is there something that happened to you or, or something that happened in the world that made you realize that? I think COVID was a huge wake up call for me and for a lot of people around me and a lot of people that I still, that I meet and talk to about these topics, they say COVID was a massive turning point. Just seeing how quickly the, all the freedoms you think you have get shut down and rug pulled immediately and that people went along with it and, and actually participated and strengthened it by shaming people who didn't follow arbitrary rules like this. That was a huge wake up call that I don't have, if, if this happens again, I'm not prepared to defend myself against it. And I don't think that necessarily means like go live in a farmhouse with AK 47s and defend your land Waco, Texas style, but it does mean being prepared with the relationships, with the knowledge, with the fortitude to resist if something happens like that again, and to find other people who are willing to resist and ready to resist that kind of control 
because as we'll probably get into with Bitcoin, that to me, that control is mathematically programmed through the fiat system. It, it has to happen. They either have to tax people more, debase the money, or control the system further. Those are the only three paths, and all three suck for normal people. Like somebody's got to pay for it. So it's going to be ugly in some way, shape, or form. And I don't think, and I don't want to survive it by being the mountain man. For me, sovereignty took more of a community aspect where I want to find other people like this and make sure that I'm well networked and well positioned so that when something like this happens, I can go to the places that that ultimately don't adopt the the craziness because there will be places like El Salvador, a lot of Latin America seems like this where they're realizing, okay, the world has gone batshit, but we don't have to go with it. And if we don't, we can pick up all the talent and all the people that will be fleeing from that, from the decay of the West, basically. We can benefit from that. So I think it was really COVID that set me on that path the strongest. But I've always had sort of an itch to explore and, and do different things. I don't think I ever really called it sovereignty or thought about it in those terms until the seriousness of COVID hit. But I've always wanted to explore. I've always had sort of a, a wanderlust and wanted to see what is out there in the world and develop myself and break my frame of mind over and over again. I don't really know where that comes from maybe traveling. My dad's a pilot, so I traveled a lot when I was a kid. And that exposed me to a lot of different cultures. And that may have just given me the bug for challenging myself, going, seeing different things and experiencing different ways of life. Yeah, I think that's a, a very similar story um, that I've heard on my in my travels. I've lived in 10 different countries in the last three years or so and finally settled a little bit down here in Colombia. But I think that that story about COVID and people really realizing that they're, ah, I'm, I might not be as free as I once thought I was. I, I'm tied to a physical location with a, with a job, an in-person job. Uh, and I just realized that I can work from home. I can do this exact same job anywhere in the world. Why does it make sense to or waste two hours the same <laughs> job? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Multiple <laughs> job stacking. Yeah. Um, a lot of people realize things like that, where suddenly location didn't have to be a determining factor on your life. The, um, the government didn't have to be a determining factor. Taxes are now a choice instead of, well, if you're American, they're not so much a choice, but elsewhere you can easily spend three to, to six months in another country in the world and completely eliminate taxes from your life. That was groundbreaking for people. And I went through that, that similar realization during COVID. It's when I quit my job. It's when I started my own online business. It's when I left the United States. It's when I got more residency permits. It's when I bought real estate, um, in a, in a foreign country, whether you, agree with that or not, um, is, is a moot point because it was an investment in a, in another country and I got, uh, some value for it. I know Bitcoiners don't, don't love the idea that I invested in real estate, but nevertheless, I think if you're looking for a deeper dive on what Evan was talking about, about the, the federal reserve and, and the fact that maybe the USD the US dollar is not the strongest currency in the world. Maybe there is this other option in terms of Bitcoin and, and what's going to happen with US dollar once we re reach like crisis debt levels. I did a conversation or had a conversation with Peruvian Bull on uh, the show uh, a few weeks ago. And I think you would really enjoy listening to that because it's a deep dive into the financial situation going on there, of which I do not know a whole ton about. But that's why I have Bitcoiners on uh, the show like you, Evan. So talk to me about COVID. You, you experienced that firsthand, the authority, the pressure, the lack of freedom that a lot of people experienced during that time. Is that when you also found Bitcoin as kind of a solution to those overbearing pressures? So I had actually jumped down both the Bitcoin rabbit hole and 
leaving the U.S. rabbit hole before COVID hit. I left the U.S. right before COVID hit. I had been interested in Bitcoin and reading about it and not really buying it, but a little bit in 2016, 2017. Uh, but it was more to me a technology and I was interested in blockchain and crypto and all this stuff. And I was living in New York City at the time, going to a lot of different crypto meetups and a lot of trading meetups. And I was interested in the protocols and how, how they could actually add value to the world. And I couldn't find a single person who could explain to me what value these things provided, any of them. I went to ETH NYC several times, couldn't find a single person there that could explain to me what Ethereum actually did and why it provided real value or what use case it had other than money. But for money, it was a much worse expression of that than Bitcoin. So I ended up kind of whittling everything away, understanding that proof of work was very, very important. And it was in late 2019 that I watched a YouTube series called, it was by Mike Maloney, The Hidden Secrets of Money. Mike Maloney's a big gold bug. And it's a 10 part series that went through the history of debasement of money, starting at the Roman empire and focusing a lot on the Roman empire, comparing it to the American empire and how the Romans started with full gold coins that were 99% gold. Then they would take it in taxes. They'd chip the edges off, which is actually apparently why a lot of coins have notches all the way around because the Romans used to chip the coins and take some gold off. And then they'd still have this one denarii or whatever the, I don't remember what the denomination is, but they'd have one denomination They'd take some gold off. They'd make more coins. Then they started mixing base metals into it. So, they did the exact same thing that the US and that every country is doing now with fiat currencies, basically manufacturing more money for no cost or very, very low cost and putting it out in the world. And that's when it really clicked to me because he talked about Bitcoin in one of the episodes and all the studying I had done on Bitcoin immediately, I understood that's what's value about it is the scarcity and the ability to move it all over the world all at once. It's basically gold, but a thousand times more portable, divisible, and easier to use and more scarce than gold could ever be. Predictably scarce, which is very important for a money. So it was late 2019 that I really started to grasp it. And then here comes COVID and the whole world shuts down. And then I started to see why the, the fiat system being so near its end, it's so important to have Bitcoin because the fiat system, I sort of saw the problems in an abstract and I could see from 2008, but 2020 and just the amount of money printing and the free money that was sent out. Also watching Bitcoiners say, this is going to lead to inflation. This is going to lead to inflation over and over and over again, ad nauseum, right as the money was being printed in 2020. And then sure enough, 2021, 2022, I'm in a taxi in Miami and people can't shut up about inflation. Like every taxi driver is talking about how expensive everything is. So it was those repeated experiences of, I saw Bitcoiners predicting that something would happen and then lo and behold, it happened. But that inflation was really the biggest and clearest one that really nailed it home for me that this is, this is different. Like this is very, very important. It's not some technology, some investment, like this is foundational to human society. Yeah. I think in hindsight, for for almost all Bitcoiners, it was obvious that if you print trillions of dollars in the span of a few months, the cost of everything is going to go up because you have all this money just floating around. People need to put it somewhere. They're just going to jack up the prices of their goods and services to make up for the fact that there's just all of this new money that was printed out of thin air it has zero very little value. Um, so it makes sense. It makes sense to Bitcoiners. I think it's now making sense to normies, <laughs> Nor normal people who mm -hmm. don't necessarily know about Bitcoin, nor don't know about uh, M2 and, and monetary systems and all that kind of stuff, that if you print a lot of money, the value of things is going to inflate. That's common sense. I was just in Miami this weekend and was talking to a bunch of friends who I, who are doctors 
and they're making 200, 300, 400,000 a year, and they can't afford to pay for housing in Miami. One, it's because of their ridiculous debt and tuition and student loans that they had to incur. Um, sometimes upwards of like $300,000 of just student loan debt. They're paying 3000 to 6000 to $7,000 a month to pay down those debts. And they'll still have a how they'll still have to pay those debts in 2054, 30 years from now. So the, the, the inflation hits people hard, it hits wealthy people hard, but it hits poor people even harder because they don't have the access to uh, circumnavigate that system as much as wealthy people do. Uh, however, Bitcoin has kind of given everybody this democratized way to leave the system and to escape that, that inflation. You went to Bitcoin, or I'm sorry, you went to Thailand in 2019. Is that right? Or is that, was that 2018? No, it was late 2019. Like September 2019. So, it, it, okay. So that was your, during your journey down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin that you left the United States and headed to Southeast Asia. Is that right? Yeah. So, and why why Southeast Asia versus Latin America or, or Europe? You could have gone anywhere. So the short answer is because I had a good feeling. I went to Thailand and Southeast Asia in 2016, right when I graduated college with a bunch of friends. And like I said, my, my dad is a pilot. I grew up traveling, thankfully, a lot all over the world. We went to Europe probably 20 times before I was 18. And I'd been in several places in Asia, but I'd never been to Thailand. And Thailand just struck me as so different from anywhere I'd ever been. So livable, the culture is so friendly. It's very, it just feels very warm. It's hard for me to describe it because even when I moved there, I had a good feeling, but I, I didn't really, I wasn't able to put it into words. But just being there, I felt happier than any any other place I'd ever been. And obviously, the first time I went there was like on a big vacation. So that could have had something to do with it. But that impression really stuck with me. So my original plan was, I'll quit my job at some point, I get burned out on working, take some savings, and go to southern Thailand to be a dive master for a year, and just relax on the beach and read books and then come back to the US and work. And then I discovered remote work in 2018. So I started working, I worked for Envision briefly, the design software that's shut down recently, actually, but it was a really popular software. That was the first time that I had known about remote work, but I associated it with a small, weird startups that never went anywhere. And Envision I had used at my old company and everyone I knew working in product and software was using Envision. It was like the prototyping software. And then I found out that they don't have offices. They only have WeWorks where they give everyone like a full WeWork pass. So you can work all around the world, anywhere you want in any WeWork. They had a couple small officers like, like in New York and Chicago and stuff with five, 10 people that would regularly come into the WeWork, but everyone else, including the CEO worked from home. So that kind of changed my perception of work that I can have a job at a really legitimate company, but work completely remotely. And then I got hired at Kraken. I worked at Kraken, the, the crypto exchange for like three years, and they're also fully remote. So when I had that job, I was living in New York, I'm working from my tiny apartment and something just snapped. I remember one night in the back of a car thinking, I'm done, like, I'm gonna leave. I don't know where I'm gonna go, but I don't wanna be in the US anymore and I don't have to be, I can have this job anywhere in the world because that was a big part, at least back then, of Kraken's marketing to employees is you can go anywhere you want. We won't change your salary. So I'm like, shit, I can go, I can go back to Thailand and try living there. So that was the first place I picked. I gave it 90 days. Mexico City was actually number two. I was going to move to Mexico City if I didn't love Chiang Mai and make a home base there. And then number three was Amsterdam, which would have been way more expensive. But that was another place I went where I thought 
this is very livable. It just felt very comfortable and nice and not that fun as a tourist, but a great place to to settle down and spend some time. But it ended up being Thailand. Yeah. And I just fell in love with it. So I never came back. What what was it about that Thai culture that pulled you in pretty much immediately? Um, I have met quite a few Thai people all around the world and worked with them in a, in a couple of cases. And my dad spends half the year there with, with his wife and what they, what I have noticed being around them and what he has noticed living there is that Buddhism runs so thoroughly through the culture that it's more than just a religion there. It's a way of life. And I, I don't know if you can say that about many religions around the world, but there they really live it. And to me, that means that, um, well, actually, I'll let you explain that. What, what, what can you tell us about Buddhism in the Thai culture? And that was probably a big influence on why you enjoyed that culture, but I'll let, I'll let you explain. Yeah, I, I think Buddhism plays a big role in it. The first thing I'll say about Buddhism is in Thailand, it, it is really more of a religion. There's a lot of structure around it, but really the core of Buddhism is a way of life. It's a way of looking at the world, of approaching life, of trying to live a better life. And that, I don't see that many Thais that are forwardly religious in the way that I see like Americans and, and Christians and Muslims and other religions, but their actions seem to reflect Buddhism. They're very mindful of themselves, of others. They're very respectful. There's a, a very deferential attitude that just in public life you see among Thais. Like they're very courteous with each other. One thing that it was so funny when we went to, I went to Turkey with my Thai girlfriend and it was her first time outside of, of Thailand other than going to Myanmar. And she was shocked at Turkish people just walking in front of her in a line. She's like, these people are so rude. Because in Thailand, that would never, ever happen. People are so respectful. They will wait. And, you know, if someone is someone elderly comes, they'll get out of their seat and let them sit. Like there's a very cohesive social contract in Thailand that just makes it a super pleasant place to live. And like, we don't have that at all in the US. It's like, get out of my fucking way, especially in New York. Like no one has respect for each other. And in Thailand, that, that is enormous. Everyone has a high level of respect, at least on the surface. Underneath, there's all sorts of things going on. But on the surface in daily life, people are very respectful, very courteous, uh, but also like fun and cheeky. And it's just a very relaxing and an exciting place to live for me in a way that the U.S. was not. What was that learning curve like going from New York to Thailand? That I can't, I can't think of many polar opposites than those two cultures. Yeah, it didn't feel like a learning curve. For me, it felt like I came home for the first time. Honestly, it's so weird for me to say, but I feel more at home in Thailand than I felt anywhere in my life. It really feels like home to me. And it, it has felt like home from the day I got there. So I don't really feel like I adjusted very much. Like there are certain things that I've, I've had to become accustomed to. Like people are less direct, for instance. You'll get a no when they're not actually saying no. They just don't understand the question or they don't want to deal with it. So there's little things like that that I've had to sort of adapt to. But overall, I just it felt like taking a... 20 pound weight off my back when I landed, like, finally I can relax. I'm here and you don't have all the stress of, especially of New York all around you all the time, all the anxiety and dread and people overworked and angry at each other. And all of that was just gone. <laughs> I laughed when you mentioned that attitude towards the directness, because here it's a different I'm in Latin America right now and, and the approach to inner interpersonal relationships, they're not direct at all either. Um, which is different coming from the United States where people will tell you to, to fuck off if 
if they don't appreciate your tone or, or if you're asking a question out of line, whatever. Here, if you're asking for something and they don't have an answer for you, they'll say yes, not no, mm-hmm. which is worse because then you'll go down this rabbit hole thinking, yes, I'll get this service from them or yes, I'll have this product from them. And you'll learn days down the road or weeks down the road that that is not going to come to fruition. They have a really tough time saying no here because they don't want to upset you. Mm-hmm. They don't want to disappoint you. Um, I would I would have expected that to, to happen in Thailand as well, but um, I, I would prefer hearing no than yes. <laughs> hmm. You know, it does happen. It, it does happen that they will say yes. Like that, that happened to me actually with the business question I asked of a lawyer and I had one meeting and I thought, okay, we're doing this. Like everything's good to borrow a bunch of money was the issue. Then I go back with my Thai girlfriend and she's kind of confused. Like, is he really saying yes? Because I, I was asking him, like, can we borrow the money? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And she goes, I think he thinks we're like borrowing from someone else, not from him. So we had to clarify and he's like, oh yeah, no, 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 you cannot borrow from me. But it's a similar motivation of they don't want to disappoint. They don't want you to say something that would disappoint you or set you off or something. So they'll just say what what will calm you down or placate you. And you see it a lot with like really, it bothers me so much. People come here, tourists come here and they they get really angry and they they bring their frame of mind, right? So they're yelling at someone to try and get their way. Well, that person will say anything to make them stop, basically. Mm-hmm. And it will make them stop for a few minutes until they realize they didn't get the answer that they want. And then they're twice as angry and, and flip out even more. Yeah, that's interesting. That does not surprise me at all. I see American tourists here in Medellin, Colombia all the time. And I, I've seen them everywhere across Latin America blow up at people. And here, that's not as common as it would be in the United States. That just does not happen. The, the Karens are out in full yeah. force all around the world. <laughs> do you, Evan, do you speak Thai? Enough to get by. Like, I can really? have basic conversations. Yeah. Yeah, it's getting worse because I haven't been using it as much as I used to. But I I took like one year of uh, of a language visa. So I had to go and for the visa, take classes. And I did private tutoring because I really wanted to learn the language. The first thing I learned was the the character set and how to read and write. I've been able to read and write for like four years now. I just memorized all the characters and then everything, every menu, every every sign, I'm just reading everything all the time and sounding it out and then starting to pick up meanings and words. And like every Thai that I talk to now, they say, oh, Puchan Ma, because I, I learned exactly how the sounds, there's a lot of very weird sounds in Thai that we don't have in English. I learned exactly how the sounds are represented in the written language. And then when I learned a new word, I didn't just learn as someone said it to me, I'd have them write it down and then I could save it and look at it. So I know exactly how it's supposed to sound. So I can say all the tones and the sounds really well, but my vocabulary is pretty small. My listening is not that good and people speak pretty fast. I don't understand what they're saying. So it's getting better, but it's not an easy language. It's not for the faint of heart for sure. It's structurally and every part of it, the from the letters to the grammar structure is just completely different from English and romance languages. Yeah. I, I, I've obviously met a lot of people who spend time there and including my, my own dad, and they've found the language to be near impossible to learn. So that I, I really, really give you props for one, having the initiative to learn the language, which I think is really important. If you're spending time in someone else's culture, someone else's country, I think it's really important to, to learn their language and contribute as much as you can. But for languages yeah. like that, it, it's near impossible. So props to you, man. Um, it's only what in your head. have you, what's that? It's only in your head. You can learn it. Anyone can learn it. What have you learned about the world and yourself in Thailand? And then I want to ask you about how you brought that back to the United States and, and routing across America, because that is the main core of what I want to ask you about today. What, what did you learn from your experience in Thailand? 
Well, man, I told you Thailand would go long. You're asking for like a half hour answer here. <laughs> I've got to sum this up. I mean, I think like if I had to boil it down, the first thing that comes to mind is reflecting on this, this very like Western attitude that we have of what I call the need to know. There's a, a need to analyze and rationalize every situation that you're in. And I see in Thailand and in Thai culture that people are suffering from that need a lot less and they live a lot more in the present. They're a lot less concerned when something good happens. They're not, why did that happen? I have to figure out why that happened so that I can repeat it again later. Or if something bad happens, they're not ruminating and going down a, a deep spiral as much. Obviously I'm generalizing, but I see that Thai people are just, they're much more present in their daily life. And that has rubbed off on me. Definitely. I feel like I am way less anxious and tense person than I was. I still by Thai standards, I'm pretty anxious. My girlfriend would say I'm a very anxious person, but by American standards, I feel like I have chilled out so much. And I thought as an American coming into that, like if you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said, well, that would have killed my ambition. You know, it would have had all these negative effects on my life. It's made my life a thousand percent better. It's made me way more ambitious and way more capable because I'm not self-defeating anymore. I think that's really the biggest thing is that need to know that I was able to get rid of being in Thailand. That actually surprises me that that more, the slower attitude about life and the more present has actually contributed to more ambition in your life um, and more entrepreneurial motivation is, is kind of what you're saying, right? Yeah. 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 That, that surprises me because I think here in Latin America, you see the opposite, generally speaking, and, and probably there as well, but maybe you're an outlier, um, where people come here and think because the cost of living is far lower, because the pace of life is far slower, that they don't have to push themselves as hard as they would in the United States or Canada or Western Europe to earn a good living, to start building a family, to build generational wealth and freedom. I, I don't, I feel like a lot of people, once they come here, feel that they, mm -hmm. everything is slower and, and less pressured. Um, and I would assume it's there as well. So that's kind of cool that you've bucked the trend in that. Case. I think we're talking about two different things, really. What you're talking about is like the, the push to move forward. There's definitely less of that in Thailand. And you see a lot of people that move to Thailand so that they can chill out and do nothing and not, not feel that push and pressure from everyone around them to, to improve, to build a business, whatever it is. But I think what has really affected me is having less fear and less doubt about myself that has unblocked me from doing the things that I wanted. So I think if I was still in the US, I would have more fear about, well, if I quit my job, I'm putting back my career. And what are people going to think of me when I go into a dinner party and I say, oh, I'm working on my startup or whatever, instead of working at a big company like everyone else, that fear is all gone, especially the social pressure of exactly that, the dinner party example. That's gone because everyone is doing different strange things of expats at least are all doing weird things when they move abroad because it's hard to hold down a normal job. So I have a lot less of the, the things that were holding me back and that's allowing me to, to be more ambitious, to be more creative, to do all the things I wanted to do anyway. That's really powerful. I'm, I'm glad you've had that realization. So that the fact that you are less fearful today of things like rejection, risk, um, failure, which are usually the biggest pain points for people in trying to achieve their dreams, trying to go out there and do something that maybe they haven't done before. That's usually the big challenge. So mm -hmm. the fact that that challenge doesn't exist for you as much as it did before, was that the impetus for you starting Rite of Passage? 
Yeah, that was a big part of it. It's it was a mentor of mine that came out here and suggested after the tour that I did in the US, why don't you do something like that here? Like what I think what he said to me verbatim was you need to show people this place. And you think it's normal, but this is not normal. Like people do not see this in their daily life and they need to see it. And the way I conceptualize it in my mind is I don't have to do what I used to do and create these big dreams of this massive corporation that I'm going to build that's going to end up being this monolith that I'm fearful of because I don't know how I'm going to get to that point. And instead think of it as one trip. Can I organize one trip and deliver one great experience for one group of people? And that I was confident that I could pull that off. So I took each step and planned out a trip and figured out the budget and got the bookings and signed people up and did it and it worked. So now I'm in the second stage of, okay, how do we scale this and do more trips and more people and, and more structure and, and level up the experience again, and just keep going one step at a time. That's really helped me put it into perspective. So for those who are not aware of what Rite of Passage is, can you give a, a brief explainer? Yeah, should have gone through that. So the Rite of Passage is a motorcycle. The, the short way to put it is a motorcycle tour, a series of motorcycle tours. Really what I am aiming to do with these tours is increase the sovereignty of everyone on the trip. The first tour that I did was more of a, a cultural experience. I did it with just Bitcoiners because I knew that Bitcoiners will get along together. Anyone who really calls himself a Bitcoiner knows what that is, which I vetted everyone on the trip. They're going to get along really well. And they're also going to be open to experiences that sort of break their brain, that change their perception of the world. Because to, to understand Bitcoin, they had to break their perception of the world, most likely. So I created an itinerary around these things that that I call like experiences that money can't buy. Things that took me years of living in Thailand and a lot of random connections just to discover this Muay Thai trainer, this hill tribe, these, these different things that we visited and then take people through them. I know that no other tour in Thailand is ever going to any of these places or experiences. And so that was the first trip. And now I'm doing one in the US, I'm doing that one again. And then I'm doing the mastermind, which I can get into as well, which is like half business, half adventure kind of mixing this idea of the open road and the experiences of culture in Thailand, changing your perspectives and opening up your mind and combining that with masterminds with entrepreneurs to level up your business and get better and better. So eventually I want to have retreats and rides and tours and experiences all over the world, all under this one brand that are all based around bonding people together and making them more sovereign. It's funny. I mean, I, I knew about this business coming in to this conversation and it's funny. I'm just thinking about this, but there are so many people that I have met in Latin America. Uh, I know one really good friend of mine here in Medellin who has just fallen in love with motorcycling around this region of the world. And he's a big crypto guy, not, not necessarily on the bit, the Bitcoin, uh, network quite yet the Bitcoin train, but, um, he feels like one with his motorbike and he has absolutely loved that experience. He used to motorbike across Australia and New Zealand and China and has incredible stories to share from all these different, uh, obviously wild experiences that he's had in these countries. And I'm sure it's a similar, while he was solo, this like mastermind ride that, that you have organized, Evan, is such a cool opportunity for people to experience that same oneness and, and mm -hmm. freedom uh, that you might experience on, on a bike and on the highway and, and riding through just wild, wild landscapes, but also doing it surrounded by people who are like-minded, who have a similar pull towards sovereignty and, and masculinity and responsibility that we talked about in the beginning of the show. Um, that's powerful stuff. What, what is your goal, at, like a business goal for 
rite of passage. You mentioned that you want to get into different regions of the world and organize trips. Um, what are you trying to do with rite of passage? I want to build a massive network of, of sovereign individuals. Like that is really, that is what I want to do. And you asked me for a business goal. That is a business goal. Like the, the deeper and deeper I get into this, the more and more I realize like if I try to say, I want to expand in this way, I want to make this amount of money. I end up grinding myself to a pulp and I hate it. It's a terrible way to run the business. What I want to do is that's really what I want to do is bring people together. And I know that I will figure out a way to make money and support myself through that. But the other long-term goal of it, as we talked about sovereignty at the beginning of the, the episode, building that network of, of sovereign individuals, that alone, if I don't make a penny out of this, will be so valuable, so incredibly valuable. Like I've experienced that with Bitcoiners that just making connections with Bitcoiners, I have places to stay all over the world for free now. I have people that will take me as tour guides through their their city or their country for free. And it, that's that's something that money can't buy, you know, those relationships. So that's really what I want to develop is this network of people that that get this and come together around these ideas. Totally. And and you were generous, Evan, to you were generous enough to offer a a huge discount for Freedom Files subscribers and listeners. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that before we before we part ways here? Yeah, so one of the rides that I'm running this year, there's three different dates. It is called the Mastermind. So that's the, the last one that I mentioned where we're basically riding for five days through Northern Thailand, starting and ending in Chiang Mai on scooter. So it's accessible if you are not a motorcycle rider, but you can ride a scooter. If you've ever been to Southeast Asia and ridden a scooter, you know what to expect. So we're going to ride for about five days and every day, the morning will be some activity or some ride. And then the afternoon will be masterminds where we'll have a structured and facilitated session. There's only eight people on each set of dates. So those eight people are going to sit down and we're going to go through different problems in your business or in your personal life, whatever you want to talk about, whatever you think is highest priority for you to fix and to get help on and talk about it with the group. So it's just for entrepreneurs. You have to be running your own business. Uh, but the discount code is freedom files and that gets you $600 off the ticket price is 1800. So it's like a 33% discount on the trip. Five days. Like I said, Chiang Mai. Yeah. Like I said, very, very generous. Uh, that's a huge discount. So, and, and like you said, there are only eight people who will make that final list. Um, so I think it's important if you're interested in that mastermind riding across Thailand on a bike surrounded by uh, very motivated, ambitious other entrepreneurs. That's a crazy cool opportunity. Evan, we have to do this again. Uh, we still have so much to discuss about, about Thailand, about riding across America and hitting 30 different cities and, and meeting up with Bitcoiners all around, all across the country. Um, is there, one last thing you want to leave people with about sovereignty and freedom. I think the, the most important thing I could say is just get started. Like don't let analysis paralysis stop you from taking the first step. I didn't know when I landed in Thailand, I didn't know where I was going to stay that first night. And now I'm here starting a business in Thailand. So it, it all happens step by step. But if you don't take the first step, you can never take the second one. So take that first step, take that first leap. It can be buying, for me, it was buying a plane ticket. Just buy a plane ticket and then you know, I gotta go, I gotta figure this out. And then everything will fall into place. Excellent, brother. Thank you so much for, for coming on, sharing your wisdom from a few years in Thailand and we'll, we'll definitely have to do this again soon, very soon, maybe when you're on the road. Sounds good.